Well, we're going to get started for the next panel discussion. Okay, if everyone can please take your seats, I think we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Next Generation Global Health Security Leaders Panel. I'd like to thank our uh, George Washington University hosts, as well as the NGO Steering Committee for putting together a really fantastic event about the Global Health Security Agenda, and thank all of you for joining us. So we have a really impressive group of speakers who will share their proposals on ways to strengthen the global health security agenda. These speakers represent a new group, the Next Generation Global Health Security Leaders, uh, which we are launching today at this event. The idea behind the Next Gen GHS Leaders Group is that in addition to engagement by governments, international organizations, and non-government stakeholders, the global health security agenda will also benefit from novel and creative thinking from young professionals and students from around the world. The purpose of this group is to provide the next generation leaders with a platform to exchange ideas about the GHSA and to empower them to contribute to implementing its goals. Going forward, we seek to establish an international community of young professionals and students interested in con uh, contributing to global health security. Our vision is that these individuals will have an opportunity to inject new ideas and energy into their respective organizations, governments, and professional communities. Launching this group has been truly a team effort across multiple organizations, and we have many people to thank. It's been established as a collaborative effort uh, between the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the UPMC Center for Health Security, the National Defense University Program for Emerging Leaders, and Georgetown University. We also owe special thanks to Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins from the US State Department, who's uh, provided leadership in this effort and to uh, a number of Global Health Security Agenda partner countries who've brought with their delegations uh, representatives from their respective countries from around the world. So that this is truly an international project. And we're, just, we're just getting started uh, with this project and we've already gathered an impressive group that includes representatives from 15 partner countries affiliated with the Global Health Security Agenda and we're looking to gather more and more international representation. And many of, those, uh, many of those participants are here today in the room. So if you're interested in joining this Next Generation GHS Leaders Group, uh, we encourage you to attend our afternoon breakout session, which will be taking place here in this room at, from 4.30 to 5.30 PM. And it will also be webcast uh, live, and we'll have a virtual breakout session on Twitter in case, for those of you watching online. So um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we'll have four presentations, uh, and then, and which will be approximately 10 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor to, to questions and discussion. So here to my left, we have Dr. Erin Sorrell, and she'll be talking about prevention of emerging zoonotic diseases. Dr. Sorrell is a senior research scientist here at the Milken Institute School of Public Health, and previously she was a program officer at the U.S. State Department Biosecurity Engagement Program. And then we have Rebecca Fish, and she'll be discussing a new business model for health security. Uh, Re uh, Rebecca is a senior policy advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health and Director of National Vaccine Program Office at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Laud Boateng uh, from, from Ghana is going to be talking about biosecurity training for public health education programs in Ghana. He's a Mandela Washington Fellow and a physician who spent nearly five years working in rural regions in Ghana. He's also managing an Ebola campaign, which seeks to increase education and awareness among African youth. And finally, Dr. Ellie Graydon. Uh, she'll be talking about data and modeling to inform emergency response to biological events. She founded and directs the Division of Strategic Systems and Analysis at Griffin Scientific, where she and her team perform complex systems analysis to support the use of data and modeling to inform decision making. And so without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Erin. Thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so today I'm just going to talk briefly about the prevention of zoonotic diseases, and that is one of uh, the major targets of the global health security agenda. So as an NGO community, what can we do to assist with that? Um, just some opening remarks about zoonoses. Um, you know, and the emergence and spread of microbes is one of the major risks associated with global health security today. And we have to consider both wildlife and domestic species when thinking about the reservoirs of diseases that are of public health importance. 75% of emerging infectious disease is zoonotic in nature. Um, and many of these zoonotic diseases are neglected um, basically because ministries and other sectors have other very important things to consider, including clean water, maternal and child health, um, and other infectious diseases, including non-communicable diseases. And as our colleague from Kenya mentioned, that's a, a huge problem when you consider having to prioritize within the global health security agenda. Communi uh, communication and coordination is for national surveillance and response. Uh, networks is essential for uh, preventing the spillover of zoonotic diseases. Uh, and there needs to be a systemic um, and systematic avenue for information sharing uh, for this coordination. Um, however, resource strengths um, are a big player in preventing uh, cross-sharing and, and information sharing. So looking at really trying to prevent this spillover is, uh, again, stressing has been discussed in a lot of the morning panels, uh, collaboration across the sectors, um, both traditional and non-traditional players in the role of, of public health and um, animal health, and really looking to either establish or build on already existing networks, um, taking advantage of lessons learned from previous outbreaks and, and situations, and uh, looking at uh, aligning priorities with already existing frameworks that are either um, national, regional, as mentioned with the IDSR, um, as well as international, uh, looking at international health regulations, as well as OIE's PBS pathway and, and terrestrial code. Looking at um, identifying priorities across all stakeholders. I think one of the, the very important things to look up, up, at, up front is having a conversation with every stakeholder imaginable to figure out priorities across the board to really have an effective uh, mechanism for implementation, making sure the conversations are had and priorities are identified um, not only from a public health or animal health uh, sector, but looking also at environment, um, potentially even tourism, um, import and export, um, as well as interior and, and, and defense. Um, and, and with that, really looking at what are the priority diseases. Uh, the global health security agenda looks at prioritizing at least five zoonotic diseases for each country. Um, I think that that can be um, discussed at both national and regional levels, again, cross-border surveillance and response and coordination, and looking at mechanisms for action and coordination and, and defining roles and responsibilities. I think it'll be very important to have not only, um, as mentioned this morning, a lot of activity and networking at the community level, um, but also very important to have the political will um, and support at the highest levels for this integration and coordination. It will be important to identify gaps that limit the information sharing and then develop strategies to um, fill those gaps, um, whether they're short term or long term. And I think something that, again, had been brought up this morning and uh, would like to reiterate is um, in development of these plans, taking the opportunity to continually review and revise strategies, test them out, um, make sure they're applicable not only for current situations, um, but potential and future uh, concerns and priorities as they arise. Um, and I think that in coordination with the Global Health Security Agenda uh, and the IHR, um, as well as uh, OIE regulations, um, these are all measures, targets, objectives, whatever we'd like to call them, that are living documents. Um, checking the box to say that we've met a target does not mean that the, the project or the work ends. Um, and so it would be very important to keep uh, working towards uh, this collaboration and uh, prevention of, of zoonotics. Thank you. Thank you. So 
My comments today are really about the importance of using business strategies to address health security challenges. If you think about it, health security is really a product. It's something that we want people to buy into and support. And given that, there's a lot that can be learned from business about how to have a rapid launch, how to have effective uptake, and generate support for what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Many of my remarks today really focus on incentivizing innovation in drug development, but these same concepts apply to many of the challenges uh, that we face. And the idea here is really to look at these challenges through a different lens. So the first rule of business is to know your customer. And notice I didn't say partner and I didn't say stakeholder. Uh, I said customer because it's about understanding somebody else's interests and objectives, their motivations and needs, something we've talked a little bit about this morning. Uh, take drug companies as one example. The government would like them to invest in countermeasures development. It's a lot easier to do that if you understand their business model, their core competencies, and really what they're good at and what they're not good at. When you have that kind of information, you can make better investments and more sustainable investments. It's equally important to know all of your customers. I go to many preparedness events, and I don't see any pharmacists, any wholesalers, any IT vendors, any faith-based groups. These organizations are critical in a response, and they're often not at the table. It's fairly alarming to realize that here in the US, we can track our online shoe orders more effectively than we could distribution of a pandemic vaccine. <laughs> and it's not that that technology doesn't exist, it does, it just hasn't been prioritized. So I think that we need a much more strategic approach to understanding this health security market and the customer segments in order to have a more effective response. Now another goal, as many of you know, of the Global Health Security Agenda is to elevate attention. And you do that by crafting a compelling message through effective marketing strategies. It's about building a brand. And to be clear, the brand is not an image of an eagle. It's not a catchphrase. It's what you do and what you deliver consistently over time. An organization that's building a very strong brand right now is ISIS. They know their target audience. They control their message. They use a wide variety of platforms to reach their audience. It's very alarming to compare that reach and that agility with some of the messaging that we're doing around health security right now. In the US, the organization that sort of coordinates many of these preparedness initiatives is called FEMC, or the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, which is quite a mouthful. That term has 5,000 Google hits. Compare that to Al Qaeda that has 20 million, or Zombie that has 60 million. My point is simply that we've got a little bit of a brand or awareness gap or possibly an opportunity. And it's really easy to discount the marketing or the messaging but if you can't communicate with your target audience, if you can't make people care about these issues, then we failed before we started. So again, we need a much more sophisticated strategic approach to customer marketing. And this health security brand has got to be owned and managed by one team so we don't dilute the messaging across so many different agencies and groups. Now, a lot of people would say that there's not a lot of investment in countermeasures because there's not enough money. That's part of it, but the bigger issue is that it's confusing. Who's in charge? How do these organizations work together? A lot of companies don't even know where to start. Companies invest in what they know. Congress funds what they understand. So there's a big opportunity to make this simpler. Uh, there would be a lot of value in having a more detailed training program about how to do business with the government and medical countermeasures development. We also want to highlight the organizations that are getting it right, like the DOD, who are building a global coalition. Uh, unfortunately, many of the existing options to try to learn more about this space are insufficient. So we've got to make it easier. The goal here is make it easier for the investors, the volunteers, people who want to contribute funding, make it less easy for the people who don't. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it's a big challenge in this space. Now, when people talk about incentives in drug development, what they usually mean is money. And the economics are important, but there are other things that your customers value and care about. For example, access to decision makers, access to new markets, reputation. Good press increases a company's stock price. It increases their likelihood of getting bought out. It increases their likelihood of a co-development agreement. Take a look at those three headlines that are fairly recent. 
if you're a board member at this company, you'd be pretty concerned. You'd want to fix this. And you would probably have a very strong incentive in making a sizable investment in something with a big public health message to send the message to the media and to the public that you're trying to fix things or change things. And the point there is simply that there's more to an incentive than the drug price or the contract size. Now, as many of you know, there are many kinds of incentives for drug development. And I think that at the end of the day, there's not likely to be any single fix um, that changes the situation. It's more likely that there will be a series of incremental improvements that kind of change the value equation for some of these products, particularly for antibiotics. Another thing that we hear a lot is that there's no market. And again, the funding process does certainly add risk the way it's structured right now. But maybe there's an opportunity to build or redefine the market. Maybe the opportunity is helping that small company access a global market. Maybe it's leveraging scale so that instead of getting one purchase order as a company, you get a whole bunch all at the same time from participating countries. Maybe it's using the money that we have more efficiently. And certainly, there are also new markets. There are three to four million preppers in the United States, and that is a multi-billion dollar market opportunity. Obviously, these people cannot buy all countermeasures, nor would we want them to. But the point is that good businesses think creatively about their market. They look to expand, to evolve, and they don't just accept the status quo. <coughs> Another thing that we talked a lot about this morning is that good businesses establish performance metrics. When they have a billion dollars on the line, they want to draw attention to some key issues. We need to do the same thing. Uh, UPMC has made some nice strides in this area, uh, but it does appear that there would be an opportunity to develop a global health security dashboard to measure and monitor progress. That might include new antibiotics in development, creative uses of contracting authority, um, customer satisfaction scores, their perception on how things are going. Measurement can be incredibly powerful, but it loses its impact if we try to measure too many things. So there's a big opportunity here, but a need to really craft this measurement tool carefully. But the single biggest problem, I would say, in health security is not the funding, it's not the regulatory hurdles, it's the lack of clear, accountable leadership. Who owns this space? In business, they develop the strategy, then they create the structure. The government has the exact opposite paradigm. We take all these groups, all these organizations, we put them in the same room, and we say, make it work. That sounds really nice, and decades of business research shows it doesn't work. Decades. So a, a small team with clear authority is infinitely more effective. So there could be some value in more of a Manhattan Project approach uh, to some of these challenges. And when I say that, what I mean is trying to replicate this idea of a clear mandate for action or urgency or passion for cause. Some of the challenges in this space go so far beyond just simple requirements or contracting uh, improvements. So I had proposed the creation of a dedicated global health security team. This team would be tasked with developing the integrated strategic plan. That includes the operational piece, the who, the how, and the when. The idea here was not to detract from any organization's role, but to really add clarity and urgency to the process, to build a framework so that we could leverage the strength of these groups, leverage some of these action plans, and really add urgency to this process. Uh, and again, as we've sort of discussed this morning, that team needs to be able to communicate across sectors. They have to be creative. They have to be able to catalyze change and be agile. In the words of Steve Jobs, a small team of A-plus players can run circles around a giant team of Bs and Cs. We need a good team on this. In the corporate world, they say businesses don't fail, leaders do. If a business fails, they, if they face bankruptcy. If we fail, lives are at stake. Take, take a look at this photo of this little boy. First, his mother and siblings died of Ebola. Then he got sick with the disease. By the time this photograph was taken, he was too weak to put on a shirt or to cover himself. The people in the background are afraid to help him or touch him for fear that might, they might get infected. And the local clinic refused him care because they just didn't have the capacity or the capability. I include that image today because it's a reminder of the faces of health security. This little boy was named Sa Exco. He died in Monrovia a month ago. And that's why we don't want to fail. 
So my question to all of you today and to the leaders in this space is what else needs to happen before we write the integrated strategic plan? Everything we've heard here today, everything we see in the news indicates that there is a fierce urgency to do this now and to do it right. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Um, so my name is Lord Boate. I want to thank uh, Cameron Beth uh, for inviting me to this uh, Next Generation event. Actually, I was sitting um, at a meeting alone designing an Ebola awareness campaign, and she came, sat by me, and asked what I was doing. Eight weeks later, um, here I am. So I'm talking about the capacity building uh, for biosecurity and disaster management preparedness, and I'll up, give an update on my Ebola awareness campaign. Um, I finished uh, my MPH, and it's surprising to note that despite the fact that many of the disasters that um, severely affect us occur within uh, West Africa and East Africa, you don't have any dedicated uh, academic institution that runs programs that are able to research and train uh, multidisciplinary um, specialists on emergency preparedness. Uh, this saddens me a lot. So my proposal was that um, we need a center of disaster preparedness in one of the institutions uh, within West Africa or East Africa. How are we going to do that? How are we going to make this sustainable? How are we going to do this within one or two years? CDC has a field epidemiology uh, master's program that runs in Ghana and Kenya. I believe my good friend is uh, one of the uh, products of this uh, great collaborative. Now, all we need is um, to piggyback this master's program on this event because many of the institutions have showed good, um, um, good, good um, efforts at deploying this program. We we'll need um, just lecturers, both local and uh, from um, any other um, country, willing to participate. We could have uh, George Washington University partnering with University of Ghana or, or universities in Kenya to do this, and this would mainly affect the second semester programs because the first semester programs you'd have people taking basic um, epidemiology or public health programs, then in the second semester, people will do the specialty training in biosecurity training. Now, let me borrow your term, who, what, where, and how. Who are coming to these events? We're picking um, individuals from the security agencies, from the medical institutions. We've, we've seen how disaster preparedness during the Ebola campaign was not coordinated. We need uh, biotechnologists involved in this uh, program. And the good thing is that because of cost sharing, the budget of security agencies are quite um, sufficient. They will be able to sponsor um, various uh, staff for this, event, uh, for this program and um, be able to train them. And when they finish, we're going to have a, an alumni network of security, biosecurity conscious um, young professionals who would begin research and begin to advance this um, this course in their various institutions. So this is on the biosecurity um, capacity building program that I'm encouraging that be, should be formed within West Africa to coordinate all the regional efforts by different universities. This is not uh, something that I want for Ghana, it's something that I want for the region. Many people have said that uh, we failed um, Liberia when we failed to have a a high leadership response. I say we failed Liberia when we accepted that a country of four million deserves um, doctors of uh, and 50 doctors. I mean, if we accept that four million people should have 50 doctors, we failed. So this is, and the global health security agenda wants or seeks to build, you know, the capacity to prevent such a thing. So the second thing was, uh, is on the Ebola awareness campaign. Fortunately, I was selected as one of 500 young African leaders to come to the U.S. as part of President Obama's initiative to, um, for some leadership training. We had an, uh, a summit in, at the White House, and following that, this was July, the Ebola was like a big issue, but in terms of education and awareness, I felt that not much was being done. On the night of the, um, the last summit, we prepared an Ebola emergency or 
public service announcement. Now, I had this 500 young Africans who spoke different languages. We all want an Ebola message in English and French to Liberians who, or Ghanaians who have not gone to school. So quickly, we've, we, we just gathered young Africans uh, who translated the message in their local dialect, and we spread this across um, social media. This was very effective. It, it, it triggered many young people to start doing their own emergency or door-to-door -door campaigns on Ebola. But this is not enough, so how do I effectively get to the local person, the, um, the minimally educated, with good information on Ebola. So that's the next step we're doing to. And I'm so excited that everybody was talking about um, community leaders. And this is so key and this is so vital. I'll talk about two community leaders that we have identified uh, for our next step. Drivers and religious leaders. Now for religious leaders, Target and Krugers are able to predict that um, a woman is pregnant even earlier than his um, relatives. Now if you come back to in our setting, who is able to do this? Our religious leaders are able to tell who, who missed church, who didn't show up in the market. Sometimes when someone is uh, sick, the first person they call is, or with something like Ebola, where we, we are saying that you are not likely to survive, they are likely to call the religious leaders. Yet we are not engaging them, we are not educating them on how to educate them, how to relay information to community health workers who will then pass the information on to. Um, health personnel. The second, uh, the second group of people that uh, we'll be planning on using are drivers. I don't know how many people have been to Africa, but like to take public transport in in in, in Africa is a is a dream that you should, you should participate in. So you sit, <laughs> you sit in you sit in this bus and um, you are you are used to the bus stop at the bus stop. You sit in and it moves. It doesn't happen. You're just sitting and wait for this 50-seater bus to get full. In between, what happens? You have um, faith leaders, you have people who sell drugs come into the bus and they sell uh, drugs or they give you a whole brilliant, nice sermon and sell drugs at the end of the day. So now what are we going to do? We're going to try and get the drivers and educate each one of them on Ebola awareness. This is a fantastic focus group discussion of people trapped in a bus and um, we're going to focus on border, border, border towns. So drivers that move from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire and drivers that move from the rural or peripheral areas to the city, we're giving them good in, uh, information on um, Ebola, not only on prevention and control. We need to tell them about quarantine, how difficult quarantine is, how difficult um, treatment is, because all they see is that your if a relative is picked up sent to quarantine, you don't even get to call the person. One day you're told that a patient, uh, your relative has passed away, you don't even get to see the body. These things uh, should be done or should be part of the educational campaign. Then we, uh, uh, we, we like daily call the drivers to collate the information. If there's any, this, is, this would be like a rumor registry. If someone is going to sneak in from Liberia with Ebola, who is going to pick it? It's going to be these drivers. And if, if these drivers are going to accept um, passengers on board, and they don't, they, they, they seem sick, but they, it doesn't click them to them that this may be a Ebola, an Ebola suspect, we are going to lose. And it's very key and vital that we use people like um, our faith leaders, our drivers, our queen mothers, you know, our market leaders. They can tell that. Uh, Mr. A, Mr. B did not come to the market today. And it's all about habits. Just like Google uses um, search the items to predict influencer, we need to use our informants you know, to gather real quality data. And we can type them by place, we can type them by time. And over time, we, over time, we can be able to de develop an algorithm to see um, uh, what's happening. Beyond Ebola, what would this group do? They will be able to help with, um, should a vaccine be developed? They will be able to help in educating people on uh, its benefits. Um, if we develop a vaccine right now, we are using it, and someone um, gets a reaction, this is going to be, you know, the rejection is going to be very high. We need these people who can talk to committee members and educate them and uh, help them, you know, 
with the um, control um, of Ebola. So in summary, this is the, an update of the awareness campaign that we are doing. We, in the, our direction now is to engage more community leaders, not politicians who never show up apart from election time, coming to tell them what to do. I hope I go home safe. Thank you very much. <laughs> So one of the things that Lau just spoke to was this importance of knowing how to use the data and the information that you have to then actually make the decisions on the ground that have to be made. And that's uh, the main focus of my work is figuring out how to take all of the quantitative data and the computational models that we have access to and actually turn them into something that is useful on the ground in the context of emergency response. And it doesn't, uh, as I'm highlighting in this, in this image, and a public health emergency can be the result of a, a large-scale hurricane, Typhoon Haiyan, but it can also be the, the outcome of an Ebola outbreak. And the real question is, how do you take these data that we now have and are now swimming in and turn them into informed decision-making and coordinated operations? How do you transform those data into something useful? So one of the things that we've done is to first start thinking about how to think about data and models in a way that moves from these very uh, computationally intensive models that are perform that are uh, built by scientists, um, half the time run on supercomputer clusters, and require a huge amount of data, but then the outputs are of limited use to an operational community. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're working with public health folk on the ground in Africa or whether you're working with your local fire department in the middle of Minnesota, they're not going to be able to use those data to make a decision. And so one of the things that we've done is to start thinking about how you transform data from these raw data and do the event characterization. Ultimately, you, you need to start to be able to answer the question of what happened. That's where those computational models, the computationally intensive models are really useful. But then you need to process those with com uh, consequence models. Ultimately, those generate the impact estimates that really define what the event is. Uh, what is this event and, and who and what were affected and to which degree? And then ultimately, you can then start to build decision support tools that can transform those data into mission-specific requirements. Those are really the data that end up answering the question of what needs to be done on the ground. We can then start looking at this at a systems level. And the nice part about the systems level analysis is that instead of just looking at, so uh, typically the systems analysis has been used uh, in the context of social interactions and mapping. But you can start looking at this in terms of how information moves within, within a system as well. Whether each one of these images, so if each one of these nodes can be a person, it can be an organization, or it can be a data set or a model. And what you're looking at is actually the movement of information between those different characters in the system. So how is information transferring? Who is it passing between? Who are the big players in the system? And if you can collate all of those data into one place and perform that analysis, all of a sudden a single image draws the eye to the primary nodes and you can figure out who the big players are in the system and where the information is flowing. And even more importantly, you can figure out where the information isn't flowing. Right? So you can see a whole cluster on the left that where none of those nodes are connected to anybody else in the system. Well, that's going to be a, that's a gap, right? That's something that we need to, we need to improve information to flow or to information transfer there. But now you can actually see it and you can highlight it. You can also see a cluster on the right, which you can imagine is just one sort of, one community that's doing a good job of sharing information within that community, but then not actually reaching back to that larger system. So we can also then use the same sort of method to then algorithmically look at who the primary information bridges are in the system. Sometimes those are going to be the big players in the system, right? If you look at nodes one and two, they're, they're very central in the system. They have a lot of connection points coming in, a lot of connection points flowing out. But if you look at nodes three and four, they're much smaller players, but they're absolutely critical in, as, as information bridges. And there's a lot of data coming out of the social networking uh, literature that suggests that it's actually these smaller players that are important linkages between different ends of the organization that if you remove those linkages, that's when your whole system collapses. 
And in fact, it isn't your largest nodes that are always the most important. But again, these are the sorts of information that when you actually do that analysis and you look at it from the whole system, at the, at the whole system and look at the way that information is flowing through it, you can see these take-home messages and really understand them intuitively. You can also then clump or cluster these resources or the organizations by type and say, well, how is information transferring between these type, different types of organizations? So what you're seeing here is a transformation or a transfer from the raw data on the, on the left-hand side all the way through to the decision support and mission-specific information on the right-hand side. This is actually a map of all of the resources in the US federal government related to emergency management. And what you'll notice is that there's a huge taper off on the right-hand side. And this is what we see no matter what system we end up looking at, that there is a that there is a lot of good work being done in terms of the raw data collection and the analysis and the event characterization. And what isn't being done effectively is translating those data into something that people can use to inform the operations on the ground. So ultimately, what you can do is if you have these data and you actually can build out a simple decision support tool, and this is speaking to Rebecca's point of, of keep it simple, what we have here, you have one, you have a very operationally relevant question, right? Does access to a new medical countermeasure actually make a difference for the, for the spread of an outbreak? And as it turns out, so every one of these boxes has a, a value behind it, and it's the output from a, from a computationally intensive uh, epidemiological model. But what we've done is organize it simply by what percentage of the population actually has received prophylaxis and how contagious the disease is in that instance, in that community in, in, with this particular disease. The real sweet spot is right in the middle there, right? If, if you're on that far upper left-hand corner, it doesn't really matter if you have access to the disease, it's not going to progress, or access to the new medical countermeasure, rather. You're not going to have spread of that outbreak by, beyond a point where the public health community can respond to it. Likewise, on the, this bottom lower corner, you're in trouble anyway. Even if you do have access to it, you're probably not going to be able to, to really contain the outbreak in that quadrant. But now, a public health decision maker on the ground can say, okay, you know what, we fall into this sweet spot. We think we have a, a, an r naught of approximately five. We think we're going to be able to get about 50% coverage. We now really need to worry about the speed at which we're going to administer that medical countermeasure and actually get it into this location. And that can also allow a public health decision maker to make those prioritization decisions for where they put the, send those medical countermeasures, where they roll out those activities, and actually use the basis, these, these computationally intensive models, but also these data to really then inform those operationally relevant decisions. And ultimately, what we're trying to make sure, and, and what I'm really interested in, and what I think there's a lot of space to grow for the global health security agenda, is in making sure that these sorts of data can, be, can keep up with the transfer of people as they move across borders. I mean, that, the image that you're looking at is coming out of Dr. Brownstein's work, but it's actually looking at the transfer of, of people between, location, between different countries and across borders. So can our data keep up with that? And can the operational decisions on the basis of those data keep up with that flow? Thank you. Uh, as you can see, we have a really diverse range of presentations from our Next Generation Leaders Group, and we have some time for questions, so I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, do, I presume we have microphones available while you guys are thinking. Um, I'll, I'll start with a question or two. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Ellie, actually. Um, can you... Can you give us perhaps, so this is a really interesting presentation, can you give us an example of a specific scenario, because this is a very sort of high, high order, abstract, very interesting presentation. Can you talk about a specific scenario where these, this kind of planning could be useful? Or perhaps a scenario where, where we have lessons learned? So most of my experience is coming out of US emergency management. Um, but I think this is, so, if you start looking at hurricanes, uh, you, there's a lot of work that's been done in terms of taking really robust uh, hurricane models, weather models, and translating that into inundation models or flooding models that then speak to which populations are being impacted to what degree. So this is, you know, what percentage of lower Manhattan is going to be flooded in the middle of Hurricane Sandy. Um, and 
the types of decisions for tools that can be developed uh, range from, say, the Army Corps of Engineers, who needs to actually calculate the cubic yards of debris that need to be pulled out uh, of, a specific, of, a, of a specific area for uh, behind a flood of a specific region um, in, a, in a certain depth. But it also speaks to how many patients are going to need to be moved from the hospital that got flooded and the generators that went down in lower Manhattan. And when you set up your emergency response shelters, what percentage of people are there that are going to be on ventilators? And how do you actually make sure that they have the resources that they need? You know, I think in the context of a much more resource constrained uh, region, what we start then looking at is, well, who do, you, who do they even call to find out who is running the public health lab in the, in the neighboring country? How do they know who to call? How do they get that information? What do those data look like? And how do they know even who to call and what to do with that data once they get it? You know, what kinds of decisions are they going to make on the basis of it? And I think right now, they may not even know who to call. When they call, they may not know what questions to ask. And there's certainly no centralized location to go and get those data. And just get it, starting at the stage of collecting those data so that then the next few steps can be taken, I think, is, is really the next, the next step to go. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll ask one more question um, uh, f for you, Rebecca. Uh, so you, you spoke about the need to uh, consider the possibility of broader markets for, for business to sort of think about new ways to redefine the market. Uh, and perhaps looking internationally. So I wanted to ask, I mean, we know that that's very challenging. I, if, I was going to ask if you could speak to some of those challenges of working internationally, and then perhaps also comment on the recent uh, scenario where we tried to share medical countermeasures in response to the Ebola outbreak in Africa, see what kind of lessons we've learned from that, and perhaps uh, propose ways we could work with industry to do a better, be better prepared for those kinds of scenarios in the future. Well, like Ellie, uh, most of my experience is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, the bigger opportunity is sort of what I had highlighted in my slide, which is to make it he easier here first. It's, you know, when I attend certain events in my old role, um, when I was working in industry, you would have hundreds of organizations showing up who want to develop countermeasures, who are interested in innovation, and it's very difficult to understand how to work throughout the system because there are so many organizations within the FEMSI enterprise. And I think to me, um, we hear so often about this limited market and obviously look at the group we have assembled here today. This is obviously a priority. We want to encourage development of new products. So the key, one outcome of this global health security agenda has got to be trying to figure out um, a work group or a team who can look at harmonizing some of these contracting rules um, and improving this process because if you listen to Dr. Frieden or Andy Weber speak yesterday, um, they were doing a, a briefing on the Hill, there's such a need for urgency here and I think you know we've got to prioritize some of these challenges a little bit more than we have. It's kind of like my comment about the inability to track distribution of a pandemic vaccine. Like we've, we've got to move some of these challenges up to the forefront so that they get um, executed and, and completed. So my, my experience personally is more here in the U.S., but I feel like if we uh, tackle that challenge, that's going to facilitate the international piece. Okay. Thank you. Do we have some questions from the floor? Please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Yes, at the back. Uh, hi. Uh, <clears throat> Liz Dempsey Becker from the Danish Embassy. I'd like to underscore exactly what Rebecca just said. Uh, many of the embassies here in Washington, D.C. are, in fact, the first point of questioning from, our, uh, from the private sector and from the public sector about how to engage with the U.S. government and various programs in, uh, in terms of where do you get answers. So uh, in addition to trying to uh, address the issue here domestically, I just want to put forth that there is a great interest internationally and that uh, there are many people that are already asking for, uh, for uh, answers to these questions. Okay. Uh, did you want to, well, perhaps we'll take another question here at the front. Yeah, uh, I had a question for Lord. Is it, um, so I'm really interested in, in your ideas of getting uh, religious leaders, but also um, cho-cho drivers. And, um, oh. I, yeah, I, I've sat on them. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but I'm interested, in, again, I mean, there are a lot of different infections that cause febrile illnesses in Ghana and West Africa. So... 
I think that messaging has to be really careful that you don't end up with them actually rejecting people who actually genuinely need to get to healthcare and generate uh, a process of fear that leads to you know, somebody who's got malaria mm. not, not being able to get on a, mm. on a trocho and go to a uh, hospital. So I think, again, it's all about messaging and marketing. You have to be really careful about that information. And, and just another comment, just, um, it's really interesting that it takes Ebola to get people th to think about doing some of these things, which uh, just saddens me, actually. Thank you. We have a question up there. Hi, uh, Lynn Goldman, George Washington University. So actually I have a question for each member of the panel. Mm -hmm. And I just want to imagine a scenario that we have some kind of a global health leaders award, okay? And you each have been awarded money, say $500,000 to do whatever you think is best. What would you each do? I mean, just very briefly, if you had that opportunity, what would you do? Thinking off the cuff, um, I'd be pretty excited about getting $500,000 uh, to do some work. Um, I think that there's a lot of work to do, and I, th I think something that was discussed earlier today about looking at a particular region and really focusing on um, neighboring countries that can work together, that have worked together, and building on existing frameworks um, and projects that have already um, shown progress and success in one aspect, whether it is uh, focused on a particular disease and building that um, network up to um, expand on current capacities. Um, from my perspective, my interests are very much in the interface of surveillance and laboratory response. So building up those networks um, from regional perspective is what I would focus on. Um, and, and really getting that uh, not only uh, communication and coordination across um, non-traditional partners, but really looking at building up laboratory capacity for, for rapid response. You can do um, amazing things with surveillance and collect samples, but if you do not have a laboratory that can tell you what you have, you don't have an effective surveillance response. So that's, that's what I would be focused on. So you probably tell from my remarks, I think the first thing I'd focus on is creating the team. Um, I think that we have a ton of great people involved in this space, and there's a ton of great ideas, and you see a lot of that reflected in these action plans, but I still think we're missing an overall strategic plan, how this all ladders up into one sort of overarching vision uh, and coordination point, and I'd want to get that team assembled, and then I'd want to do some market research with these countries and what we have talked about as some of our key organizations, because it's one thing to say what we think they need, one of the messages that we've heard here today is let's make sure we really understand what people need and then try to prioritize some of the key things that I thought were gonna have the greatest impact. But to me, um, the most pressing need in this space is getting that core team assembled who can try to build this framework to leverage all of the partner strengths. And I think there's a little bit of research that needs to go into that project after you get the team assembled. Uh, thank you. I do hope the money comes, because I'm gonna give. <laughs> I'm giving my best answer. So, uh, <laughs> so the CDC uh, put a call out for doctors to volunteer to work in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And um, I do talk about Ebola a lot. I'm running an Ebola campaign. And um, so I said I have to you know, apply or submit my name. So I went on a site and I did submit my name. And they were, there was a questionnaire. Have you been involved in disaster management? No. Have you uh, had experience in? No. All the, I mean, all the questions that they were asking, no, 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 for me. And I felt that uh, this was sad because here was a willing person uh, who liked the training. So I'll go back to my um, capstone presentation, which is, um, let's get to the center of this, uh, disaster training. Uh, you're nodding. I hope the money comes. So. <laughs> Let's get a, a, a regional center where we can train people irrespective of what's happening. So that when such an, um, an, an epidemic happens or a disaster happens, we do have people who are ready, who need just um, a little uh, training and we can deploy them. And not people like me who are just, you know, ex you know happy and you know, want to go and zero our knowledge, as the, the Bible says. Is. Thank you. <laughs> Can I think we all speak to our uh, to our pet projects? But 
I think from my perspective, I'm most interested in in, met, in pairing up with Aaron um, to pull in the data that are actually being collected in the public health labs that are already there and already doing sample testing and make sure that those data can actually be shared so that then the information that can be passed on down the line, both for both in the context of this outbreak, but for the next, to make sure that the data aren't lost, that they don't just disappear, so that they can be used to actually inform better decisions for the next time around, be used for the training that Loud, Loud wants to get, and make sure that that's actually all based on, on real data and on historical data from the locations where they're going to need it the next time around instead of all being based on lab data that are done in CDC labs or you know, in, in labs where what we, you know, there, there are a lot of great data coming out, but it's not with the local populations. Questions about? Yes, hi, Emily Kelly, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. I believe I've heard quite a bit about how to get involved with community leaders and faith-based organizations, and it's refreshing to hear it come from multiple angles. Um, with the DOD specifically, we've mentioned before that we are focused on sustainability. Often that is directly with the ministries of health or agriculture or higher education. How do we make those community leaders understand the impact? The room that you're speaking to now is a sympathetic audience, and everyone's going to nod your head because we all understand what you're saying, but perhaps the bus driver does not understand. Maybe it's more important to him to learn how to use the emergency brake than it is to recognize a passenger who might have signs of Ebola. Is this uh, something that we can do through marketing and campaigning, or is, does it need to be brought to a higher level, such as legislation? This is my personal opinion, um, but having worked in um, a couple different regions across the world, I think that there has to be a tailored message depending on the country, depending on the person and the level that you're having the conversation. I think having that political will and that high level awareness of the importance of uh, the, the, the spread of an infectious disease, the impact on tourism and trade, the impact on import export, both uh, livestock, of agriculture, um, of, of food safety. All of these things play a major role at very high levels, but they, con they continuously translate down at the community level, and it might just be changing the message. Um, I've seen a lot of very effective posters and, and commercials that have been put out, both on TV and on radio, looking at how to make it a very um, conversation piece um, at the community level and, and just making it uh, relatable to the individual. So for the bus driver, for example, um, I think it would be important to explain how um, his interaction with an infected individual may then bring that back to his family or his community and understanding that basic mechanism of, of transmission or exposure. Um, so I think, unfortunately, it is changing the message depending on the, tar of the target audience. I was just... Sorry, I'm just going to add to that again, sort of come back to knowing your customer and market research, where again, we have to be really careful of not coming out and trying to sort of say, this is the message, or we know what you need to hear, but rather to hear from these groups, this is what we think now, or this is what we believe. I thought Nigel's comments this morning were really interesting in that regard about the importance of messaging and how careful we need to be in crafting that. So I do think there's a lot of value in some of these sort of concepts of research as, as you refine that message. I think that they would indeed understand the impact of some of these uh, public health uh, disasters. If you have a flood in some part of Ghana, um, you, for like one week, you see a huge drop in the number of people who would use these buses and it affects uh, wages. So um, we can really explain to them the uh, the impact of this, but the message, the message should be tailored. But we're not going to use these drivers for this one-time Ebola thing and it ends. You know? We want them to be partners in the health promotion campaign so that uh, beyond Ebola, every quarter, if there's something that's going to be done, if it's... Um, um, talking about uh, family planning, if it's about talking about um, um, immunization for kids, if you're talking about non-communicable disease, um, we can use them as uh, ambassadors. So we're not going to go use them for Ebola, and that's it. You know, we want this partnership to be um, a long-standing partnership, where they are they are partners with uh, the ministries of health in every country. Thank you. So we have two questions. 
Oh, I guess now three. Can yeah. we take this question and that question together, and maybe yours as well, and then we can um, close out the panel because I think we're almost out of time. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Frode Forlan, and I'm working at the Norwegian Public Health Institute. My comment is towards uh, Rebecca Fish and about your interesting thoughts about using business models in health security. And um, I'm partly wondering if this isn't a kind of uh, situation or a setting where the business models don't work and, and where the markets are failing. Because they're, I, as I see it, we need to here build kind of very, very future directed investments, long-term investments in strong health systems that can yield benefit maybe after 10 years, maybe after 20 years, where the markets are not present, where people cannot pay for these services, where people cannot invest in these systems by today. And there is no market to buy these services in many of the countries where the needs, is, uh, where the needs are highest. And I think we have some strong, uh, very strong examples of good not market-driven health systems development in Western Europe, which are extremely much less expensive than the market-driven systems in the US, for instance. And, and uh, of course, you can say there is a kind of market system here by investing in health systems and investing in education. I think also there might be a market for these, and, and for these countries and for customers in the future. But for the time being, I think also we have to look mostly into public investments and having the funders interested is kind of an idea of using market forces. Because the funders so far have been interested mostly in counting numbers of vaccines given, numbers of lives saved, not maybe seeing how many lives can we save in the next 10 years somewhere else. So I think there are some challenges also of using the market models. Thank you all for your comments today. They've been really great to hear. Um, my question was sort of in a similar vein. Um, I was just curious to hear how, in a country like Liberia that's recovering from a civil war, or even in other countries with uh, nascent public health and healthcare delivery infrastructures, what is the appropriate balance between investing in uh, vertical health programming that targets specific conditions versus horizontal health um, programming that sort of boosts the general health capacities of, uh, of a country, and could some of these epidemiological modeling capabilities that we have inform those decisions? Okay, just one more question over here. So um, my question is for Rebecca. I thought it was a great um, presentation that you gave. I have worked in the medical countermeasures efforts on both the DOD and HHS, and if everything you said can come true, I would weep with joy. Um, and one of my concerns that I see, though, is um, I understand that in you know, business, the same people making the policy and spending the money, it's, it's, it's one person, so that singular message is quite clear. But in, in our government, in different departments even, we split up usually who's, who's in charge of logist, um, acquisition and who's in charge of policy. And so while we've explicitly named you know, some groups are in charge of policy, there is a lot of policy that is made in how we spend our money and how our resources are used. And I see the same kind of dichotomy. And so, so the message gets blurred because you actually have different people in charge. And so I see this, I fear the same kind of dichotomy um, arising here in that in, in this one team and the, the global health security agenda will not be directly resources, but you've got to persuade the resources to be used in, in a particular way. And so how do you prevent, how do you, how do you maintain that singular message when the people making the policy won't ever be in charge of the resources explicitly? Well, I, I, to answer a few of the questions, I still firmly believe that there's a lot of value in the sort of taking a business approach to some of these challenges because one of the messages that we've heard here consistently is about know your customers, know what they care about, um, control your messaging, establish metrics. So I think that there's a lot of value in some of the business approach. Um, in terms of my proposal about the idea of a dedicated team, uh, which I do think is critical because I think that's one of the biggest challenges where we have all of these groups involved and it's not quite clear who's fully in charge. Um, the idea behind that though is that they would have a clear mandate coming from the president or these associated organizations like the World Health Organization and others, uh, which is sort of that idea of the Manhattan Project um, piece of it. So in other words, hopefully they are resourced because the relevant organizations have made the case that this is a global uh, issue of importance and that they need the resources because that is a challenge when you have one team 
doing something, but they don't have the resources or the support to make it happen. But that was part of the reason um, why I invoked that idea of the Manhattan Project specifically for that purpose. And then just to speak to the point of how exactly do we use epidemiological models, but models in general, to start addressing these issues, you know, I think actually the greatest value in a lot of the modeling that's done isn't in coming up with a number, an answer. It's in doing sensitivity analysis around which aspects that you're looking at for a public health response actually make a difference to the output. As it turns out, when you start to model something, what you're doing is you're pulling in all of the different pieces that influence the system. And then you ask how they work together to generate an outcome. And what you can do with that is say, OK, well, if I vary this one by this much, does the outcome vary by this much or by this much? And so what you're looking for is which aspects, when we put investment there and we, and we make a shift on that input, where do we get a big change in the output versus a little change? And I think that's really the most effective use of, the, of that type of analysis, is looking at how do we most effectively use the investments that we can make to make a big change in the outcome. If everyone will join me in thanking our panelists again. And now we'll proceed directly to the next panel uh, on uh, Respond.